Hi, my name is Alison Yates and I'm one of the programmers of the Redline Book Festival, which is brought to you by South Dublin Libraries. This is our 10th anniversary festival and we're delighted to bring you at least 84 events, both live and in person. For more information, check out redlinebookfestival.ie and the program runs until the 17th of October. We're delighted to welcome Julia Quinn, author of the Bridgerton series and one of my favourite authors, in conversation with Irish author Sheila O'Flanagan. We still have a whole host of fantastic events coming up as part of the Redline Book Festival. If you enjoy this talk, why not check out our Gatsby Night with the Cotton Club Quartet, which will take place in the Civic Theatre on Saturday the 16th of October. But for now... Let's dive into the romantic world of Julia Quinn in conversation with Sheila O'Flanagan. Hi, I'm Sheila O'Flanagan and I am delighted to be here uh, this evening with the fabulous Julia Quinn, the New York Times bestselling author of historical romance. Um, Julia's written standalone novels and she's written series and I think probably she is best known for the Bridgerton series of novels, um, Regency romances, which were adapted uh, last year for Netflix by Shonda Rhimes and was probably last year's most bingeable TV, I would think, <laughs> and probably most bingeable novels as well, because um, I read them all in kind of one big gulp then myself. So I'm fangirling a little bit. I'm delighted to be here with you, Julia. Um, but, you know, when I was kind of saying to myself, OK, who's this person who's, who's written these Regency romances? I was surprised, first of all, to learn that you were American <laughs> and then that you'd done art history and then that you were thinking of becoming a doctor and so I think probably what people want to know is how on earth did you then swerve into <laughs> regency romances what was going on there um well the initial thing really is just that it's what I like to read I oh. you know since I don't know it was 12 or 13 I like reading Regency romance gothic romance I cut my teeth on Victoria Holt um all those wonderful you know mistress of melon and things like that and I read her in all of her various pen names she has many many um and so all the while while I was trying out different things thinking oh maybe I'll be an architect maybe I'll be a doctor maybe I'll do this maybe I should go to law school I don't know um I was always reading and loving these books. And so it was, that was the one constant. Everything else I was kind of trying out, but I always had this love of reading in this particular time period in my head. And I did actually take a gap year between high school and university. Uh, and I went to the UK, it was through the English Speaking Union, which is this exchange that sends students back and forth between the US and the UK. And they placed me in this very small all girls Church of England boarding school in Gloucestershire. So I've had a very unique experience for an American, which has resulted in my being one of 11 Americans who can actually say Gloucestershire. Um, and I've just always loved it. And so, you know, I, when it, I decided to try to write, it was just very natural that that would be the time period I would try to write in. Although I do hasten to add, I wouldn't dare try to write a novel set in contemporary UK. I think that... Okay. Modern Brits would find me out instantly. There's, I just, there's no way I could do that with enough authenticity. I, I don't know the culture well enough. I'm not an insider. But Regency's far enough away that I probably know as much about it as somebody from England. So I'm, I'm good. So then did you kind of have to do a whole heap of research? I mean, obviously, when you were in England, you just got, you know, you got caught up in the atmosphere and you got caught up in the feeling of England and Gloucestershire. Um, but <laughs> did, you, did you then have to, uh, I mean, sit down and study the period? Uh, because presumably you, you hadn't done that in great depth before, or had you? Well, I have to admit now that when I first started out, I definitely did not do as much research as I should have. And what I especially did wrong was that I relied on other Regency romances for the most part. Um, and okay. in my defense, it was harder to do research then. I'm old enough that when I was writing my first book, I did not have an email account. I, I had no, there was, if there was an internet, it was six guys at MIT using it. Nobody, you know, it was right before the internet kind of started to explode. So, you know, research had to be done by hoofing it to a library and finding books. And it was much harder. And um, 
but I had this really good flavor for what Regency was. I'd read an awful lot of George Ed Heyer novels. You know, at that time, American authors were writing books set in Regency, but also a lot on George Ed Heyer, who's great. And she did a ton of research, but she also, we're learning now, just made stuff up. Um, there are a lot of words that she used quite a bit in her books that were not in common usage during the Regency, but we all think they were, like delope, um, which is actually comes from a French word for throw away, but she used it as, you know, throwing away your pistol or, or giving up your giving up your shot, um, to quote Hamilton there. Um, that was not commonly used in the Regency. People, I think they've been able to find one usage of it in that manner um, until higher. And now everybody uses it all the time. Um, but, you know, we're kind of, we, we like that because I thought that she had all these big files and notebooks and everything full of Regency, absolutely true stuff. And although when you think about it, how would we know if it was true or not necessarily, you know, but because it is history and we, we weren't there. And I suppose you can make things up. But I thought she was actually the Bible, I have to say. I think she's close to the Bible. I think most of the stuff she did was really accurate, but I think she filled in a few um, few little corners herself. And, and, you know, using delope in this manner is not, you know, pulling it out of thin air. Again, it's based on a French word. People used French words all the time in their language. And, you know, maybe she found one example of somebody using it in an offhand manner once, but... But it wasn't common the way we think of it as common now. We think everybody was using that word all the time then. And another one uh, I've learned that we owe to her is widgeon, um, which people use, you know, calling silly women a widgeon. Apparently that was common well before the Regency, but had completely fallen out of favor. It would be sort of like if everybody was running around now going, gee whiz. Um, so she added widgeon back in. Um, I kind of like, I, 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 I'm okay with it. But the point is, that's where I was getting my research beginning. Why not though? You know, why not throw in these words? I mean, it's not like we're there. It is fiction after all. I mean, I suppose it, you know, sometimes you say to yourself, are you writing a history book or are you writing a novel set in a particular period of history? Oh, I'm writing a novel for sure. And I have frequently made up words and put them in just to see if anybody notices and calls me and nobody ever has. Oh yeah. Okay. Words come you have to tell us now. What what words I, can't remember. I can't remember like straight on. Um, but I've put in also words like that other people have put in. I once put in apparate, which I believe is from Harry Potter. And I actually thought it was a real word. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, it was like he wow. apparated. Um, and nobody calls me on it. I guess everybody thinks that's a real word now. Um, and then I've also sometimes put in little homages to things that are in contemporary life to see if if I can do it in an accurate way. So I put in, um, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Colbert. And I put in the word truthiness once, which is his thing. I mean, of course, somebody calls the other person and says, that's not a word. And they're saying it should be a word. Um, and I did put in one book a reference to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, okay. But what was that was, reference? Um, somebody says, just, somebody just sort of says like, how many, you know, great mysteries of life are there anyway? And, and Colin Bridgerton just goes, I don't know, 42. Um, yeah. Which is that. super I remember that because not I at all. There's nothing about it that's historically inaccurate in the way I do it. And it's always fun, you know, several times a year, somebody will reach out to me and be like, are you a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? <laughs> yes, I am. Um, but I, now, I, you know what I, like? I like that you're saying that it's fun. You know, I like that you're saying that it's fun to 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 write in the period and it's fun to write books. And because a great sense of fun does come through through the through the books and and certainly through the whole Bridget and series. And I wanted to talk a little bit about those with you because obviously they're the ones that people are probably most familiar with and um, certainly over here, you know, um, so having a little chat about, about them, but, um, I, I guess, did you intend to write a series? Uh, they, that isn't the first series that you wrote though, or, or is it? No, I had written some shorter series before that. Um, yeah. 
historical romance is full of trilogies. There's an awful lot of trilogies, maybe. So I'd done a couple, I guess I'd done a trilogy and then two sets of two before that. Um, we love interconnected books, but but I also need to make it clear that in most historical romance, um, a series means is more of a collection of spin-offs than it is sequels. Mm-hmm. And okay. we we are really careful to write them so that you can read them out of order. Um, yeah. So it's not yeah. like um, Outlander, which I love. That's a very different type of thing. That's following the same two main characters throughout. You really need to read it in order. You know, that's a saga. Yeah. Mine are, are spinoffs. Yeah. You can read them in any order you want. Um, yeah, but I had certainly never done an eight book series and I did not initially intend to write an eight book series. But when you did, was the first book in the series, the first book that you wrote, The, the Duke and I, was it The Duke and I? Is that the actual title? I call them all. Yes. When I write, I call all my books by the name of the main character. So in my mind, the books are just called after the characters. In my mind, we know when I'm thinking of your books, I'm thinking it's Daphne or it's Anthony or whatever. So the Duke and I, though, that's Daphne's story. That was the first one. You know, that's how they do it in some languages. I actually just happen to have the French Canadian edition of one of the books here. And you can see it's just Colin. All right. Okay. I probably like the name. I think they'd like the name Colin in France. Well, yeah. they all are. I mean, all of the books are like that. I mean, it, they're stuck with the names I picked, to be honest with you. I mean, all of them are just Colin, Anthony, Benedict. Oh, oh so did, did you decide, though, to put them all into the, because, um, you know, you, you mentioned a number of times that they're alphabetical, that all the children are alphabetical. Did When you started off, you wrote the first book, and that's Daphne, so she's D anyway, for starters, so she's out mm-hmm. of order, really. Um, did you, were you thinking about this? Were you thinking of this whole family and that you were going to tell the story of all of them? Or were you just thinking, I'm going to tell her story? I think (laughs) it was so long ago, but I I think I had wanted to do three in my head. I, I I wasn't necessarily sure. And once I got maybe a couple chapters in, I thought, okay, I'm going to do Daphne and, and Anthony, her older brother and Colin, because he was kind of, those were the two other characters who really kind of were the most in there. And, um, and then my editor and and I tease her about this all the time said, no, just do two because whenever somebody does a trilogy, you know, the first book is super, super exciting because you're really into it. And then they save the most intriguing character for last. And then the middle book's kind of like, you know, a little bit of a dip. And so, and I said to her, I said, well, I really like these three characters a lot. I really think I can do something. And so she, all right, all right, all right. So three. And then um, the Duke and I came out and, and by the time it came out, I was pretty much done writing Viscount Who Loved Me, which is Anthony's story, the second one. And that's what the second season of Bridgerton is, is roughly based on. And I said to her, and, and the Duke and I really was taking off in the United States in a way that my books hadn't before. and. And I think the Viscount Let Me came out and, and people were much more excited about it than any, it was just a bigger thing. And I said, do you want me to skip ahead to Colin or can I go, maybe we'll make it four books and I'll do Benedict. And they're like, oh, do Benedict. And then the funny thing was, is by the time my next contract came around, um, they actually put in there, with, uh, I didn't even realize this until I got it in writing that the next books would all be Bridgerton books. That was very specific. Oh, yeah. You were right. Yes. Um, oh, because no. it had just taken off in a way that they hadn't expected. And, and everyone was saying, yes, please write all eight, um, which I was happy to do. Although I think if I had known that I was going to write eight books, I would have planned a little better at the beginning. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I can understand that. I, I absolutely can see you start off one and you're, you're in a particular place and you write about that. And then, and then somebody says, do something else. And you have to rethink where you started from, I, I guess, you know. Well, what happened mostly for me, the biggest thing was that I realized that I was going to have three books in a row with 28 year old spinsters um, if I didn't change something up. And so, and I thought, okay, I mean, you know, you can write different stories about 28 year old spinsters, but it's still, you know, and so in, gosh, I, I guess it was maybe in the 
third in Benedict's story, I just tossed in a comment about, um, was it her story or maybe it was the next one about Francesca, the, who, the second youngest daughter being, having gotten married and then widowed. And I didn't say mm-hmm. anything about her. I just thought, okay, I'm just going to set that up and I'll deal with it later. Um, and that way I'll only have two 28 year old spinsters in a row. Um, and then we'll do something new for Francesca. And then of course I got to her book and was thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? And now I have to figure out what happened to her. <laughs> Cause I, mm-hmm. I, I had, I had no plans for her beyond that. Yeah. And that one, then you had to kind of incorporate what had happened in, in the other books, because mm-hmm. while she, Spencer, other people are Spencer. It's an awful word, isn't it? It sounds really awful. It is an awful she's word. a widow. Yeah, she, yeah she is a when widow, she's a but, widow. Yeah. But but there are other people getting married and other things going on. So when you're writing that that book, you have to refer back to other things that happened, which possibly made it slightly more complex as well. Yeah. So three of the books in the Bridgerton series take place roughly at the same time. Um, yeah. Romancing Mr. Bridgerton and then to Sir Philip with Love, they happen immediately after each other. I mean, there's barely any time goes by. So those don't cross. And then when he was wicked, kind of crosses over both of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was that was a bit of a challenge. And I'm pretty sure I got at least something wrong in the timeline, but I promise everyone I tried my best. I suppose what I wanted to ask you about in, in terms of the this series in particular, I guess, really mm-hmm. is the fact that they are so joyful in a lot of ways. And I, I think that came across in the TV um, adaptation as well, which is actually a really, really good adaptation. It was absolutely fantastic. But, yeah. you know, one of the things that you got that I often feel when reading um, historical romances is, you know, people didn't have a really good time. You know, there were so many pressures on them. You know, you read Jane Austen, for example, and the, the pressure to get married and the pressure to do this. and to behave a certain way. And obviously that is there in, you know, for the Bridget and girls, but Violet as a mother is really, she's a fantastic mother because she wants them to be happy. It's not just, Mm -hmm. I want you to get married. I want you to be happy. And I think that that really comes across um, in the books and what comes across as well is the good relationship that the girls have with their brothers and the competitiveness Mm -hmm. between them. Did you just make all that up or do you think that that was a feature of life back in Regency times? I'd like to think that somebody had a happy family like that. Um, I mean, I think plenty of people didn't, but Mm -hmm. I I just would like to believe that someone did. And I don't really know how I would know. I mean, there were lots of people who still had wonderful sibling relationships. I mean, Jane Austen was very close with her sister, Cassandra. I hope I'm getting, yes, it is Cassandra. Um, but in the end, it is my imagination. It is my sense of family. And, and, and it's something I really wanted to do because I think not just romance novels, but in all fiction and literature, I think, I mean, we just have so many unhappy families. Mm-hmm. Um, in part, because unhappy families are often very interesting to write about. And yeah. another way to make a very interesting protagonist is to isolate them. Um, and one of the best ways to isolate them is to emotionally isolate them by giving them bad relationships with the people around them. And so there's just this dearth of good mothers in literature. I mean, you know, go to Disney, all the mothers are dead. Um, go to other places. <laughs> <It's all horrible. laughs> yes. I mean, they're just, there's they're so few good mothers. And I thought, you know what? I, I, I have a good mother. I love my mother. I, I'd like to think I am a good mother and let's, let's put some good mothers out there. Um, yeah. But the thing that's interesting about Violet though, is if you do read through the series, you can really see her growth as a character. And in the very first book in the Duke and I, she is much less fleshed out than in the later books. Um, she's much more that stereotypical Regency mama. And yeah. one of the things I loved about the series was her growth throughout the series because she actually maybe the character I got to do the most with because she she's that she's in everything 
And so yeah. with every book, I got to explore a little more about her. And so that was just really wonderful because with romance series, one another thing I'm very careful about, in addition to making sure you can read them out of order, is that if I do bring back past main characters as supporting characters, you need to make sure they don't take take over the plot. Um, and it's very tempting to do so because we all love them so much. We want to see them and we want to, you know, drop in so many inside jokes about their the current readers, but you really need to use them sparingly. So Violet as sort of the eternal secondary character got to have a lot of page time, I guess. Um, and she yeah. really developed a lot. Each time she makes a difference, there's, an, uh, there's a reason for her to be there, isn't there? And, and she's adding mm -hmm. to the story and she's, she's bringing something out and bringing something new to the mix every time, which I just loved her as a character. I thought she was, she was, she was great. <laughs> well, I loved all the I, characters, I, but I, I, mean, I do, I do like this kind of idea of, of the mother who, who wants the best for her children. Um, mm -hmm. in a time, not everybody could have the best for their children, I guess. Yeah. And I do think that the adaptation did an amazing job capturing that family energy. I think some, some of my favorite moments on screen are when you've got the family together, you know, when like, you know, Eloise is smacking or was it Benedict smacking Colin in the head and they're all like pushing each other and they're just, they seem very real. Um, you know, yeah. you know, they're all privileged and beautiful and rich, but, <laughs> but you can still relate to them because they are very real. Okay. There is another thing about them and um, uh, about the family, but about the books as well, is that they are incredibly sexy and erotic. There is a lot of sex and, oh. and a lot of sex going on in the books. Um, and that's, that's not, I suppose, the norm for Regency romances. It's, it's much more buttoned up stuff, I think. Um, generally, you know, you're reading it and everybody's going, Ooh. and then, yeah, you know, the, 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 the women are deflowered or whatever. But, um, but in, this, in these books, um, the sex is very much part of it, but it's also, I mean, people are loving it. They are loving the sex that they're having. And um, it's very different. Well, nowadays, actually, in, in the Regency romances that are being written, I should back up a little. So there's what Georgette Heyer did, which is sort of the traditional Regency romance. But later, their whole genre opened up historical romance. And since many of them were written in the Regency, it was sort of Regency historical romance. And those have traditionally always had plenty of sex in them. And, and I'm actually not known for being a particularly sexy or spicy author within the genre. Um, I'm kind of middle of the road, to be completely frank with you. Um, but I do think we're not used to seeing that in period dramas on television. And so I think that kind of surprised people a little bit. But one thing I find very, very interesting in the way that the television series has been received, you know, whenever I, I see it referenced, you know, people have to put in the headline, Netflix's raunchiest show or next is steamy or sexy, things like that. And, you know, it bugs me a little. I think it's actually very misogynist. And I think that um, if you look at Bridgerton, like objectively, the show I'm talking about, and you look at other things that are on television, it's not more explicit than than other stuff. It really isn't. There's not actually that much nudity. Uh, the difference is we get to see a lot more male bodies than female bodies, which is not how we usually do it. The sex that's there is intimate and emotional as opposed to transactional. And what this really all is, is they're showing it from the female gaze. And suddenly, exactly. because this is so atypical, we don't know what to call it except raunchy and sexy and, and like it's so much different or so, so much different, that's not even English, that it's, it's so steamier or sexier or, or Somehow, I, I, I actually I know what you're trying to say there, but I, you know, as I said to you, I mean, I just thought it was erotic and joyful, and that's I do the too. People who are, who are enjoying themselves, which again, probably putting into the into the Regency period, you're, you're thinking, but well, people must have enjoyed it. I mean, it has to have been enjoyed, but you're not get you don't really get that feeling that women would have enjoyed it. Was you know, lie back and think of. England or whatever, you know, it was, 
something you had to endure rather than enjoy. And it was actually I thought it was really refreshing in the books to read it, to read mm-hmm. women saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really liking this. I think that we're talking about two slightly different things. I think you're comparing it to how like it must have been then. And I'm sort of talking about the contemporary media response to it. Um, oh, I, yeah. just, I just thought it was very interesting that it's getting labeled in this way today um, because it is joyful. It's like suddenly like, yeah. you know, make sex joyful instead of transactional and we label it raunchy. It's like, but yeah, but getting back I, to I, it, I, you know, been labeled raunchy, but but maybe maybe in the states it, it was. I didn't actually see raunchy labels oh, attached to it here. I, oh, I'll, yeah, no, honestly, the the UK press is the worst with it. Um, and it, you know, I'm it bugs me a little, but I'm also okay with it because I understand where they're coming from. And it's like we got to label it something, but um, but I, I kind of like joyful better. I think that's a better adjective. Okay, well, we'll call it joyful. <laughs> we'll call it joyful. The other thing about about the books and the series, and again, you you just briefly touched on there where you said it was coming from a, a female perspective, mm-hmm. that the women stories did have a lot of agency of their own. You know, they were even though there was way there were ways they were meant to behave, they actually did their own thing to some extent. You know, they mm-hmm. they made their own things. and um. I, I really liked that. You know, I have to say, again, looking at it historically, it's not the way you'd think that life was. But I like to also think that women did have that ch- chance to make their own decisions. But looking at it from a contemporary thing, it's a really good role model type of thing for, for even contemporary women to say, what, what do you want? You, you should still chase your dreams because that's what they were doing. Yeah. So. The, the thing with these characters, though, is that they are chasing their dreams. They are acting with some agency. And again, we have to remember that these were people of incredible privilege in that time period. But they're still chasing their dreams within the historical framework. Um, so, for example, because this is the early 1800s, my care, my female characters, even Eloise, who wants an education, is not going to be out banging on the door at Oxford or Cambridge demanding to be let in. It's just too early for that. Um, it's just it has it, we've got, you know, maybe if she were 60 years later, we would have progressed to the point where she could have thought that that was even an option to bang on the door in that way. And it, we're just not there yet. So so my characters find different ways to to do this. Um, I, I wrote a short story. I guess a novella once where you know, the main female character is loves astronomy. And so her act of abel- rebellion and her act of agency is just simply pursuing it on her own. Um, and, you know, in, in a world where maybe there isn't a, a rule saying you can't do this. I mean, there's a rule saying you can't go to the university and do it, but there's certainly nothing in her society that is encouraging her to do this or making it easy in any way. So they have to sort of find their own ways to try to, to, to do these things. And I like to think that I'm writing the women who um, maybe weren't the ones who were at the front of the march, waving the flag, storming, you know, walls and everything for, for women's rights, but were the ones who were like slowly, like pulling out brick, these walls brick by brick, making it ready for the next person to come in and, and push it down. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with the time period in which I write. And a lot of it has to do with just the stories I'm trying to tell. Um, again, not that they're ordinary women, because again, you know, they're all, they're rich. They, they have this great, even the ones who don't have titles, like, you know, I, I have, I'm writing about people of privilege, but um, I, I want to make it clear that everyday acts of defiance are also important. That you know, even the people who didn't necessarily make history are still important because they're the ones who made it possible for the other people to make history that, um, you know, you, you don't have to be extraordinary in a historical context in, in the, the timelines of history to be extraordinary in your own life. Yeah. I, I mean, I like to think that they are, they were the parents and grandparents of, of women who did even more yeah. radical things, right? In the mm-hmm. period that, in actually, in the period that that they were growing up, 
having 28 year old unmarried women was quite radical, wasn't it? You know, I mean, 28 year old, they were so close to being on the shelf. I mean, they sort of oh, yeah. were. I mean, it, what one of them were saying was saying, I can't remember, actually, I'm sorry, I can't remember which book. But, you know, she was saying, well, I can sit with the um, with the mamas. You know, I, I don't need a chaperone because I'm so old, you know. 28 when you think about it I mean it's extraordinary isn't it uh, yeah it's like almost half my life ago and I'm like I don't feel that old but <laughs> I know did you have a favorite character in in, in all of the we've we've kind of concentrated on Bridgerton I guess but but within that universe did you have a favorite character I mean like everyone I love Lady well, Danbury pardon I love Lady Danbury. Did I get to be Lady Danbury? I mean, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Um, I, I think she, in the book, she's even more acerbic than she is in the show. Um, maybe because in the books, I think she's a bit older, actually. Um, they, she's a little bit younger in the show. And she's, she's even more at the point where, you know, I'm just saying whatever the heck I want. Um, so I, I think Lady Danbury. But in terms of, like, romantic protagonists, no, I can't choose. I the way I describe it to people, and this is probably, you've written many books, so you probably have a similar sense when I get asked, oh, favorite character, favorite book. And for me, there are pieces of them. Each book and each character has something about them that is very, very special to me. And it might be, it might be something that comes across on the pages. It might be something that has to do with where I was in my life when I was writing it. Because as you know, you know, people may read a book in, in a day or a few days, but for us, it's many, many months. And so it's, it's this longer experience that, you know, of, of memories and things that happen at that time or the ways that the writing of this book made us feel when we were doing it. And so each book has something special and I can't, I can't really pick. I know it's like being asked to pick your favorite child, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, who is your favorite? They all are. But I, 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 yeah. I've often, I usually feel and the one I've just finished is my favorite at that time because I've poured something of myself that was important to me, to me at that moment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm going to confess that probably my favorite character is Eloise because, the, and there was a little bit of me that whilst I knew there was going to be a romantic story for her, I, I did wish she could be the, um, the suffragette who ran away. And although she did run away. To some That's true. Um, um, yeah. I do think also that, you know, Eloise is definitely getting more screen time than she got page time in these early stories. So I think people are also loving her even more than like if, if you were reading the books along with the show, I think probably you would actually love her even more because you've seen her more on the show than she got to be in the books, um, which I loved. I, I absolutely adore Claudia Jesse's interpretation of her. I love her. Um, I actually got a chance to speak with her very briefly last week when I was in London and I was telling her how I also saw her. She was in Vanity Fair, which was another period yes. piece where she played a very different woman. And even though it's still, you know, both, you know, she's in the same type of dress and whatever, her, the physicality of the character is so very different. And I love the physicality that she gives Eloise. Eloise is kind of always a little bit lurching forward as she talks because she just is rushing into things. And I just think she's brilliant. I love I love how lovable she's made her lovable and obnoxious, you know? Yeah. I, I just think she's, I, I think she's lovely. I, I, everything about her. I think she's a great character. Mm -hmm. She's a great character in the books and she's a great character on the screen. And I suppose, I suppose we should just, you know, before we, and before we have to finish off, because we're talking about the screen and the, and, and the books. Um, did you, Clearly, you must be happy with how, how it translated to the screen because obviously you had a, a vision in your head and, you know, Shonda Rhimes had a vision for the, for the screen. Mm -hmm. Are you happy how, how it turned out? Oh, my gosh, yes. I think, I think they did an amazing job. And uh, I, I mean, one thing is I actually am not a very visual writer. So, you know, in some ways, maybe it's easier for me as an author to opened my mind to a visual adaptation of something because I didn't have a very clear vision in my head. I, I knew the characters, I knew the story, but I don't picture them very specifically. Uh, but now I do. That's very interesting. I, I actually have a book coming out fairly soon. I have an advanced copy of it here called The Wit and Wisdom of Bridgerton. This is actually the US cover, not the British cover, but 
it's it's favorite quotes and stuff. And so I had to go back through the books and and skim them a little, which I don't do very often. I don't revisit my own work very often. Um, but was very interesting. What was very interesting was that I do see the characters now and I see the actors. And so it doesn't matter that in the book, Simon has blue eyes. I see Reggae Sean Page. I mean, I don't know how I can find anybody else. I throw me a little I mean, bit, I have to say, but he's so good looking. Oh my gosh. But yeah, so that's, that. there was that. But also the other thing, which I thought was fascinating about the adaptation was, I, I remember so well reading the first script um, and getting to the end of it and thinking that they had adapted it and structured it in exactly the way they needed to. And I wouldn't have thought of it. Mm. So I was like, we've all made the right decision here. I've backed off. I've handed it over. I've said, you guys take the helm. And that was the right thing to do because, well, for one thing, I'm not going to tell Shonda Rhimes how to make television. I mean, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know who is there. Um, But I just think they did a brilliant job. I am so delighted with it. Oh, truly they did. And they did structure, I mean, they were quite true to the truth to the novel, you know, and very true to the characters, which was, which was great. And, but also I suppose visually it was so, it was sumptuous, wasn't it? You know, it was gorgeous. There was, oh, yeah, I think it was lovely. there was one um, critic, I don't know who was called it a visual feast. And I think that's exactly what it was. It was just, the visuals were so amazing. And I was so impressed with how you have this adaptation where there's almost nothing in there that's a word for word line pulled from the book. And yet the characters are absolutely true to who they were. The The overall romantic story arc is true. I mean, we've added things in and, and things have changed around a little bit, but it's so true to it without being even close to word for word in any way. And I just, I'm absolutely delighted. And um, I, I honestly- yeah, and I, so there- the, the series two is in production at the moment. Is that what you're saying? There was a series two and, and are they going to keep going? Do you think is, is that possible or. Well, it's been renewed through series four. Right, so that, okay. yeah, that was incredible. Um, that's Shonda actually called me for that, which was really nice. I mean, I, I am not, you know, in day-to-day communications with Shonda be lovely if I were, but I'm not. But she she called me for that news because she was so excited too. And she said, she was just like, look, they don't ever do this in, in on Netflix. This is a crazy. And, I, and I'm sure it had to do with a lot of things. I think, I think there's a certain economy of scale when you can um plot things out in a certain way and 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 like because they also got to, you know, nail down all these incredible uh on-site locations to shoot at. And so the great news about this, though, is that it means that I think between series two and three and three and four, we won't have to wait as long as we've had to do between one and two because they can get moving on it faster. Yeah, well, I suppose they wanted to see how well one did before they right. thought about something else. And one was just such an amazing blowout of success in every way, you know, story, I, structurally, really, you must be ecstatic. It's it's unbelievable. It's just, I think I described to someone once I said, it's like every day something new happens or I hear about something new. And it's just so wonderful that you're, you're, when you smile so hard, you have to laugh, you know, when it would yeah. just like you're, you're, and, and that's how it's been. It's just been one wonderful thing after another. And, um, I mean, I, my books are now translated into like Macedonian. It, this, you know, it's just all these, you know, these little things that, you know, that beyond the show too, it's, it's just amazing. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, me, I have no words. I, I write it's words fantastic. for living and I have no words. It, it's, it's yeah. so thrilling and, and wonderful. And it's great to see, it's great to see a different way of looking at the genre as well, you know, mm-hmm. from the, from the TV series and, Oh, look, you know, fantastic, Julie. What can we say? So for yeah. you, what what now before I let you go? <laughs> um, well, I, I need to really finally get started on another book. Um, I've been taking some time off, um, both kind of enjoying the show stuff and, you know, doing things like this. Um, also, um, with the pandemic, my husband is an 
uh, doctor of infectious diseases. So this has been a very crazy time. <laughs> Somebody has to do it, right? And so I, I found like with the pandemic, I I really just wanted to be here to support my family in a big way because, you know, it hit us. I mean, although, you know, we have been so fortunate and, and lucky, nobody in my family has gotten sick, but it has hit us in a very personal manner because, you know, we have somebody working so hard in the trenches. I mean, he's done like 150 interviews trying to give good information about this. And so for a while, I was just like, I just want to support my family whose lives have been so disrupted. Um, but I am, you know, working a bit harder on that. I, I need to get back to work on, on writing, but I do have a graphic novel coming out um, sometime next year. I co-wrote with my sister. Um, this is one of the little characters here. I don't know if you can see it. That's Eggs Merelda, oh. the baby pigeon. Yeah. Um, it is, it, it's actually very sad. Um, my, my father and my sister were killed in a car crash earlier this year. Um, and she was my co-writer with this. And so that's why it was delayed, but we are bringing the book out. And I'm, I'm so incredibly happy that the rest of the world will be able to see what an incredibly talented artist she was. Um, so that, that will be out and that will be released in, in the UK and Ireland, although I'm not precisely sure when. And that's called Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron. And it's actually based on a book within the books that first popped up in It's in His Kiss as something that this ludicrous gothic novel that Hyacinth would read to Lady Danbury once a week when she would go over to keep her company. So that's coming out next year. And then at some point I'll, I need to get going on an actual historical romance novel again. Yeah. But you'd be leaving the Bridgertons behind and moving on to something else. I don't know. It'd be more like if I do something with Bridgertons, it'd be more like coming back to them because I finished the Bridgerton series quite some time ago and wrote a number of other things, including actually a set of Bridgerton prequels, which is the generation earlier. So, um, yeah. so see, I, I, uh, Ro is that right? Rokesby. Rokesby. Okay. Yeah. It was the Rokesby family. They live near the Bridgertons, but there's plenty of Bridgertons in the stories too. And you, and you do get to see one of my favorite things I've ever written in the last book of that series called first come scandal. You do get to see Anthony and Benedict and Colin as little boys and babies. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's fun. And you go say it's, in like that but you know i mean equally it's good to write something different and yes. you know different characters and deal with different characters because you know I'm, I'm sure people are just keep going on and on as we have done to some extent here about bridget and but but you have just a vast and absolutely vast array of, of work behind you and and obviously more ahead of you um yeah i will Julia. say I was just going to say the first time after I finished the Bridgerton series, I had been working on it for probably eight years. And the first book that I wrote after it was very strange. It was very weird to suddenly be in a different, slightly different world. So, so we'll see. I don't know. Like leaving your family behind or something like that, I guess. Yeah. I do that, you know, I, I don't mean I can't do that and leaving people behind, but I can't write a series. I can't bring characters from one book to another, all of mine have to be completely different. I've occasionally brought characters back in a story or something, but I have never done that. And it's, you know, on the one hand, I, I think I would be hopeless at it. And then the other is a certain loveliness to staying with mm -hmm. really good, strong characters for a long time. But, um, mm -hmm. Well, you still have loads of things to do. You have loads of books to write. And, yeah. I, I hope and, so. Yeah. And loads more success, I would imagine, because at this point, you know, you're just a superstar and it's been just fantastic to be able to talk to you. It, she it, says, it's, <laughs> it's been pretty exciting. It's been pretty exciting. So, yeah. Um, no, it, it, yeah. And it's been lovely to talk to you and lovely to, to be able to have this chat despite our occasional technical difficulties that, that messed yes. us up there. But, and I but, want to know, I want to know which of your books you think I would like best. Not which is your favorite, but which one you think I would like best. I, I actually think you would like my most recent, and that's not just because it's my most recent, but it's called Three Weddings and a Proposal. 
So there's a lot of stuff going on there. But my car, even though it's called Three Weddings and a Proposal, my character is neither interested in weddings nor proposals, nor has any okay. weddings or getting married herself. Um, and it's it's a book about being true to yourself. And in some ways, I think you would like that because there is a touch of that in the Bridget and Girls as well. So I'm on it. That one. That's the one I'm sending to you. Sending to you. Oh, Don't no, no. no, 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 no. You I'm know what? I, I, I have a credit with Amazon.co.uk that's just sitting there. And, you know, I, I don't need Amazon to like hold on to my money forever. It's just, it's sitting there and well, let me get it. I hope you, let me, let me enjoy it. I've had great pleasure reading all your books. I had super pleasure watching the TV series. So, and it's rare that you get the two things together. You know, oftentimes you'll think mm-hmm. one is way better than the other, but both were absolutely fantastic. Um, I know that there was something you wanted to mention at the very, at the very end here. Yes. Um, I just wanted to offer my support and just say that um, I, I was offered a, a stipend to come and speak here. And I've asked that it be donated to Laura Lynn Hospice, which is Ireland's only children's hospice, um, which I learned about because the amazing Nicola Coughlin, who plays Nellope Featherington, uh, is the patron of this particular uh, charity. And um, I also feel I must say, if I'm speaking to the Irish people here, that she is your national treasure. She is just the loveliest, most wonderful person. And there should be statues erected in her honor everywhere. Um, but I, I would want to encourage everybody to look into that if you are looking for um, a place for your charitable, I guess, euros. Use euros. I was about to say dollars, but you don't use dollars. Your charitable euros to consider... <laughs> Took me a minute to consider um, Laura Lynn Hospice, which I believe is right in Dublin. I'm not 100% sure, but it is Ireland's only children's hospice. It is a wonderful charity and well deserving of whatever you're giving. That's a fee that you're going to donate. To them. So, Julia, it was my absolute pleasure talking to you. And um, I, I can't wait to, to look at the second series. I'm going to go and read the Rogsby's, I think, because I haven't read those. Um, I wish mm-hmm. you'd like more massive success in the future it was it's it's just fantastic thank you thank you and hopefully you know i will get over to ireland at some point i've been desperately wanting and you know covid's made everything a bit a bit trickier but thank you very Blast. much this has been so much fun thanks julia bye